<laughs> this is more people than I usually get to my readings. That's not saying much. <laughs> Welcome to the 85th anniversary of Astounding Stories. I'm your host, Mr. Rock. Um, nobody gets that one anymore. Wow, it's so old. Um, so we're here to talk about Analog, the magazine that's been around for friggin' ever that we love and that, we, that is a part of our lives. I'm Ian Randall Strock, and I am a publisher, editor, writer, blah, blah, blah. I worked at Analog for six years as an editor and made my first professional sales to the magazine. And that's why I'm on this panel. This weekend, I'm here as the publisher of Fantastic Books. Come see me in the dealer's room. We're publishing these three books this weekend. Ooh. And let's let have the other panelists introduce themselves, and then we can talk about analog and other stuff. I'm Bud Smarhawk. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> That's a very very Hellsberg introduction. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, I, I've got one of the books. Authors that, suck. That's uh, the guy in this walking this weekend, and uh, I'll autograph a copy if anybody anybody buys from him. And. Uh, uh, I've written a few stories for Analog over the years. 40, and, uh, 46, 40, no, 40? No, no. I, yeah, you bring that up. Uh, there was an article in, in the thousands issue uh, which just came out uh, a couple weeks ago. There's an article in there on, on various statistics about uh, Analog. And one of the statistics in there is the number of fiction pieces that some of the more famous writers and uh, I looked down the list, and there was Isaac Asimov with 48 fiction pieces published in him, uh, sound. And I thought, son of a bitch, I've got two stories that haven't been published yet, and that puts me six behind Isaac. <laughs> so I get six more story sales, seven more, and I will have beaten Isaac Asimov, provided I live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. See, I compared myself to Isaac because his last story was in the September 91 issue and my first was in the September 92 issue. That was the year I had my first one after I came back to writing it. This brand new author, Bud Sparhawk. Oh, God. You want to tell that story? Well, first we should let... Oh, let yeah, Ed Dick. I'm sorry, yeah, I stopped. Yeah, I'm Jamie Todd Rubin. Left my thing upstairs. I was drafted onto this. Uh, I am a writer and blogger and um, I've had two stories and two editorials in Analog. I also, for a while, wrote a column, a blogging column called Vacation of the Golden Age, where I was writing about reading every issue of Analog from July 1939 through uh, uh, December 1950. And um, so, I, I mean, cover to cover, too, letter column to everything. And that was so much fun. I wish I had more time to, to finish it up. But, um, but so I kind of got learned a lot about the history of the magazine. Cool. What, you're looking at me, I'm supposed to talk first? Um, unfortunately, while I know bits and pieces about the history, having actually worked with the magazine, you know, my, my greatest knowledge of the magazine is the six year period when I was on the editorial staff at Analog, because Buck was already Analog by that point. Um, actually, it changed names from Stony to Analog before I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it kind of Yeah, it's like in oh, that whole year the Oh, the, 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 yeah, the morphing logo. Morphed, the logo morphed that yeah. whole year. Um, yeah, I, I remember walking in the door there for my first interview in November of 1988. Because I'd seen the three-line classified ad in the New York Times saying, Wanted editorial assistant for science fiction magazine, 380 Lexington Avenue, New York, New York, 1036. Yeah, I remember that too. And I said, I know that address. I've been sending them stories. That's either Analog or Asimov's. I need this job. And I sent them a resume and the cover letter basically said, give me the job, give me the job, give me the job. And I made it through the first cut. And then they called me up and they said, come on in for an interview. And it turned out it was Analog and Asimov's. And I was stunned. It was both magazines. I thought, wow, this is so incredible. This is the, the, the major science fiction mag, the entire field in two magazines. And they want me to work for them. And I went into the interview expecting the palatial editorial offices of Analog and Asimov's. Analog, Asimov, the magazines. And I knocked on the door, and they opened the door, and it was one room, and it was 10 feet by 20 feet. There were five desks, and eight filing cabinets, and a wall of bookshelves. And that was the entire editorial office for both magazines. And the, the intern was not allowed to come into the office on Tuesdays because that was the day that the editors came in, and then there wouldn't have been a seat for the, the intern. And I looked around and I said, 
wait a minute, these, these are the two major science fiction magazines, and this is, well, there, there were other offices with support staff, but the editorial office, that was it. And boy, was that a letdown. Um, but, you know, they were still MLOG and Asimov's, and I sat through the interview and said, give it a job, give it a job, give it a job. And they called me back for a second interview, and then they said, if we offer you the job, are you going to promise to stay more than a year? Because both of my predecessors had left within six months. And I said, of course I'm going to stay more than a year. My dream job is, is to throw out one of you guys and take your positions here. And they gave me the job, and my second day in the office, which was the middle of January, 1989, <clears throat> there's this loud voice singing in the hall outside of our office. And the door opens, and in walks this little old nevish, heavy coat, big golden hat, singing boisterously in this loud voice in this harsh, harsh Brooklyn accent. And Sheila Williams, the, edit, the managing editor of Asimov's, who was, the, well, Asimov's has an analog at the same place, waits for the nevish to get undressed, and then she says, Isaac, I want to introduce you to our new editorial assistant. This is I am. And I look down at this little nevish, and he looks up at me, and he says, you're not a cute little thing. So both my, the editorial assistants, mind you, for both magazines, Analog and Asimov's, because they shared, they each had an editor, they each had a managing editor, and they shared me, and they shared the intern, who couldn't be there on Tuesdays because the editors were there. Um, I said, you're not a cute little girl. And I said, you're not a 10 foot tall god. And what's with this voice coming out of your mouth? Because I've been reading Isaac Asimov. And it, it, he doesn't have a Brooklyn accent. And Isaac said, I'm not making up a, a limerick for you. <laughs> and three months later, one of the, uh, Tina, the managing editor at Analog, at this time it was Analog, said, uh, an author's coming in from California next week. I said, oh wow, I'm going to meet my first author. I don't even remember who it was. It was some small author who sold, I think, three stories in the never And I said, I'm going to meet my first author. And she said, what about Isaac? He's in here every week. I said, he's not an author. He's, he's Isaac. Um, but it was an incredible experience working there. And, and just the history, even in that little cramped office with, let's face it, these were third-hand desks. And the typewriters on each desk, you know, kind of old. Uh, I walked in and, you know, you, whenever you went for a job interview, you expected a typewriter and everything. There were typewriters on every desk, and by the time I left, you expected computers. But this little, dingy, cramped, grody office was, was the seat of history, and I, you could feel the history. I, the, the shelf, the bookshelves on the wall, which every issue of Analog from the beginning, and, you know, the shelves were this high, and they were neatly placed, and you could look at the spines. They were all black print on white, and then there came a point when they wrote color, which I think started in the 1970s. They started putting the color on the spine. And it was great, because they all lined up these little shelves, except for the two-year span that has to lie down, because they did it in this format in the 60s, which was a mistake. Um, it was a wonderful experience. I felt that history. And whenever I would go to the Hugo Awards while I was there, and even after, Stan Schmidt would stand up, of course, and get the John Campbell Award first. Stan was the editor of Analog. And he would start by saying, I sit in John Campbell's chair, and it is my great pleasure to and he would introduce the award, the award winner. And that obviously wasn't the chair that Campbell's tush ever touched. But I, even that first day walking in, you can feel the history in that office. And, and though we've moved, I mean, there were four owners while I was there. And God knows how many owners Stan had been through those three. Um, but there's just something about it. It's not physical stuff, but it, it's 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 astounding. It's analog. It's there, and it, it, it defined the field. To show you how the fortunes of the magazine are going today, Sheila and Trevor share a desk. The editors, yeah. When I was there, the editors worked from home. They came in one day, and now the editors are down to sharing a desk. But the, the, the space is a little bit, although they share the editorial assistant amongst the four magazines now. When I was there, I worked for both science fiction magazines. Now they also do mystery. Well, I have a, I have a, a long history with astounding and analog code. I uh, think I was about uh, 10 years old when I saw a story of Peter's Digest by this guy called Ray something. Can you speak of this a little bit, please? It was about Mars, and it was about uh, a group of explorers who find it's very much like I am. And uh, this final scene is this uh, parade of characters, like good people, carrying the explorers out to be buried. 
and it really affected me deeply. And I didn't know it was science fiction. And, uh, about a year and a half later, I think it was Hollywood magazine. They had another Ray Bradbury story on what I said. And I said, this is interesting. Uh, but I was only 10, 11, and I couldn't get the library card yet. It was involved in the MB12, which was a library card. So as soon as I turned 12, I went down to the, to the library and uh, found out they had this little yellow tag on the spines of books, si yellow tag, red letter, science fiction. So I would get out my free books, which is all I could take out at one time, and I would check them out, a little card stand, and then I would go, I walk probably a mile, close to two miles, uh, 12 blocks, 12 blocks, whatever that is. Uh, and I would read the books, and the next week I would come back and get three more. And, uh, then we, we moved out of Baltimore City and moved out to the, to the country where the library